design a cyber attack against a large software company where the attacker has nearly infinite resources. Hi everyone, we're here today with Mo today for a security engineering mock interview. For those of you who aren't already familiar with Exponent, Exponent helps you get your dream tech career with our online courses, expert coaching, peer-to-peer -peer mock interviewing platform, and interview question database. Check it out at tryexponent.com. Okay, thanks so much for being here with us today, Mo. Uh, would you quickly introduce yourself to our viewers? Sure, thanks for having me. My name is Mo. I'm currently a security engineer at Google. Prior to this, I was in security at Facebook. Okay, that's really awesome. I'm excited to hear all about your expertise with this really interesting question today. So let's get started. Our question today is, design a cyber attack against a large software company where the attacker has nearly infinite resources. Okay, um, very cool. What is the motivation of this uh, attack or what is the target? Uh, let's say that you're trying to target the company's source code, um, which is a rather large code base of maybe like 100 gigabytes. Okay. And just curious how big and how old the company is? Um, let's say large. So uh, maybe like 50,000 employees, and uh, they've been in operation for over 20 years. Okay. Um, are there any restrictions on scope, time, or any other requirements? Um, so let's say that you're not limited in terms of like uh, time or resources, but you shouldn't get caught and you shouldn't uh, threaten any employees with any harm. Okay, sounds good. So I would like to use the cyber kill chain attack model mm -hmm. for this, um, just to give us some structure. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. I'd love to hear like what the different stages of this model are and how you actually plan on using each of those. Yeah. So. We'll work our way through first stage uh, with reconnaissance and open source intelligence, second stage uh, weaponization, and then delivery, the exploitation and privilege escalation phase, um, the persistence phase, doing command and control, and finally attack on objectives. So the first thing I'd like to do is gather as much information as possible on the company so that we can leverage that and making our attack more effective. Okay, so this is for the reconnaissance portion, right? So uh, what kind of information are you currently looking for? Right, so uh, I'd start with scanning the web for emails, social media, LinkedIn, GitHub, <laughs> uh, phone numbers, conference talks, um, you know, for employees, executives, uh, any potential, you know, high value targets we might have. I would also check recent password dumps mm -hmm. for any password reuse among uh, the employees. Um, would also be good to research office locations, um, data centers, vendors, and it would also help to understand what stack this company uses. Uh, if they're known to use certain libraries. Um, maybe what cloud provider they use, if it's like AWS or uh, Google Cloud, um, who their DNS provider is, and any other software tools used. Uh, and I guess it would be also good to fingerprint their platform architecture and controls to know what kind of um, security they might have, if they have like firewalls mm -hmm. or uh, application whitelisting or blacklisting. Yeah, okay. I like how extensive and varied a list that is, actually. Can you tell me a little bit more about why specifically that information would be useful? Sure. I think figuring out what software or operating systems, um, et cetera, that the company uses gives us the ability to target vulnerabilities in those applications or what kind of security controls we can expect. Say, for example, if we know that the company uses Chrome as their browser, then Chrome extensions might be a great attack vector that we can potentially explore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that you have this information, you mentioned that you would move into weaponization next. So how does that go? Yeah, so for the weaponization phase, um, you know, we're looking at weaponizing vulnerabilities in programs that we've targeted that we know this company's using. Mm -hmm. This might be through uh, recent publicly available exploits or maybe buying malware on the dark web, mm -hmm. or maybe an in-house vulnerability research that we've done to craft zero-day vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And since avoiding detection is one of our priorities, we probably want to develop a custom payload to avoid signature-based detections like Yara. Uh, we might target one or more specific bones in specific versions of programs and implement some kind of anti-forensics like obfuscation or encryption, again, with the goal of evading detection. This malware could be embedded in a PDF, uh, Office macros, or like I mentioned before, a Chrome extension. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that sounds like a lot of pretty sophisticated malware that you'd potentially be using. How do you decide when you might want to build that malware yourself or uh, buy it from existing uh, sources? That's a great question. Um, so if our assessment is that their defenses are unsophisticated or commodity grade, custom malware would be the way to go um, to be able to bypass their controls really easily. But if their defenses are more sophisticated, we might consider buying from more advanced malware vendors. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I think that's a lot of information about weaponization. And you said after that comes delivery. So what does that involve? Yeah, so the delivery stage, we have a few options for how we're going to get our malware into the company systems. Um, one thing we could do is use an email attachment or um, USB flash drives. You know, Hack5 just announced their new rubber ducky. Um, or we could do the classic phishing website. Mm -hmm. So our earlier uh, reconnaissance may have given us some email addresses within the company that we can target. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, maybe one of their office locations could be nearby and we could you know, go over there and drop some USB drives around. If we're lucky, somebody might pick one up and plug it into their work computer. And you know, the rubber ducky has um, the ability to install malware via keystroke injection which is essentially pretending to be a keyboard. Um, but if we go for a phishing website, um, we could use you know, a browser and browser attack, which is nearly invisible. This was in the news recently. Mm -hmm. um, get users to sign in um, via SSO to a website and then download our malicious Chrome extension. Mm -hmm. So yeah. to minimize our chances of getting caught, um, you know, we can use a two-stage delivery system where um, the malware that we have uh, in the attachment or in the uh, flash drive only has the bare minimum functionality to be able to download and trigger the second stage for the, the full remote payload. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, we're at the persistence uh, phase of the attack. Mm -hmm. So we have our malware inside the company and it's on one of their systems, but you know if uh, they were to reboot it, then you know, our malware would no longer be running. So we want to establish persistence. We oh. could um, do this using registry keys if it's Windows, um, things like run once, or if it's Linux, we could use cron jobs um, or like services like system D or Windows services. Um, you know, there's, uh, we could inject um, commands into a shell script um, that boots up when they log in. Um, you know, we could hijack uh, file system, uh, file associations. So, you know, our computers, uh, when you click like a PDF file, like um, it, your operating system knows what program to open that PDF file with. So mm -hmm. we can modify that to get it to open with our malware instead mm -hmm. and make it seem like it's behaving like normal, but um, it'll um, undetectably also trigger our malware. Um, and other stuff, you know, um, maybe like process injection to, to hide it uh, into an existing process that's trusted on, on the system. Um, yeah, so now that our malware ins is installed, it needs to communicate with the command and control server so that we can uh, receive instructions. Okay, yeah. So uh, you just mentioned you've installed the malware, uh, you've made sure that it persists through various methods, and now it needs to uh, communicate with the command and control server. So how exactly do you make that communication happen, especially in a way that is not detectable? Yeah, so I think using traditional protocols would risk being picked up by network security controls. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe not SSH or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we should use a discrete custom communication protocol that okay looks like normal traffic on the network, we could use something like um, Google a Google spreadsheet or a Spotify playlist as a custom or decentralized uh, C2. So uh, that could look like, you know, we have 
um, the, the malware recognizes certain songs as a certain command. Um, you know, so, you know, like, um, hit me baby one more time could be like, download this file or upload this file. Uh, we could have another song that has another command to scan the files and store that somewhere. Um, but to the network uh, control systems, this will just look like someone uh, accessing a, a Spotify playlist. So it won't look suspicious. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So once you've done with, well, once you're done with all of that, like you've communicated with the command and control server without uh, any detection, which was really creative, by the way, with the Spotify playlist, what comes next? Yeah. Um, so now would be a good time to do a little bit more reconnaissance since uh, before we kind of relied on whatever we could find on, on the internet. Um, but now that we're inside the company, we have some more access and we could do a network scan. We could, um, like I mentioned, we could scan the programs and files that exist. Um, we could even go through the email inbox uh, to figure out who else is in the company, what the relationships are like, what's going on. And, uh, you know, host info too, collect some information about the computer that we're, our malware is running on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can, you know, we can harvest clipboard data for potential passwords, especially if um, they're using a password manager. Mm -hmm. uh, very common thing you have to do with passwords, you have to copy and paste them. So uh, if they're copying, pasting them, then we can intercept that from the clipboard data. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, you know, our, our first person that we compromise might not have enough privileges for us to access the code base. So to do this, we would have to conduct some lateral movement. And this could be like using internal spear phishing to mm -hmm. compromise someone with higher access. Mm -hmm. Once we have higher access, uh, we can take action on our objectives to steal the source code. So we could look for the code repositories. Um, if we find them, then, you know, we're done. Um, but, you know, if, if it's not that easy, maybe we could look for build or test servers like Jenkins or GitLabs. Um, we could try to look for Docker containers if they're using uh, some kind of containerization system. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's the case. We can implant our own malicious container image that's modified mm -hmm. to uh, behave as, as normal, but also uh, exfiltrate the, the code base to our command and control server. Yeah, OK. So I like how many different methods you've mentioned um, of possibly exfiltrating the data. And how would you do any of those without uh, being detected? Yeah, that is a lot of data. You know, I think you mentioned uh, like 100 gigabytes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If we're trying to get that much file out, uh, data out, without being detected, um, we'd have to make some, some trade-offs, uh, probably with speed and you know you don't want it kind of like hundreds of gigs kind of going over the network in the middle of the night, that would be really suspicious. So uh, we could use some tricks like DNS tunneling, uh, encryption and steganography. Um, you know, we could hide some of this data in like images or in, in, in songs, in uh, files that kind of look, um, you know, very, very safe and, and normal. Uh, but I think leveraging common web ser services would help us hide our activity the best. So we could exfil using Google Drive or Dropbox uh, or Pastebin or Ghostbin. Um, this would kind of just look like normal web traffic. And, uh, you know, if from our research, like uh, in, in the first stage, if we know that they're using G Suite, they're probably using Google Drive a lot. So nobody will blink an eye at seeing a lot of traffic moving over to Google Drive. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think this is a great place for us to pause. Thank you so much for being here with us today and like walking us through this very interesting like um, attack model. Uh, so I'd love to like pause here and talk a little bit about like how the interview went. Like, uh, what do you think went well? And what do you think you'd want to improve upon? I think there are a lot of edge cases that weren't uh, considered. I think, um, you know, obviously in such a sophisticated attack, it can go wrong in a lot of places. So, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking of now is like, um, what if the company is using two-factor authentication? Yes. Um, that could be a potential obstacle for us. Um, you know, so for that, you know, we could uh, social engineer uh, the user to, to give us their two-factor code. Um, you know, there's frameworks out there like Evil Jinx too that do this. Um, I think another thing that you know, I hadn't considered before is 
um, you know, the risk of burning an O day um, or zero to, zero day vulnerability, those are very rare um, in in this space. So I think we probably want to start out by using um, publicly available exploits um, that maybe they haven't patched against yet before we burn a, a zero day. Um, yeah, and uh, maybe even thinking about balancing the speed of our exfiltration uh, versus the amount of data we're getting out, the throughput. So potentially like instead of being in a rush to get all of the, the code base all at once, we could potentially get caught if that's attracting a lot of attention. But if we're only sending a little bit of that data at a time uh, over the course of a couple of months, then I think that would even make us more successful in evading detection. Yeah, I think that's really well thought out. It was clear that in your solution, you were thinking both of the short-term and the long-term implications. And I appreciated just how detailed you were with uh, describing each um, step in the uh, attack model. And then also like all of the different ways that you could accomplish each of them, uh, depending on like what you find when you're trying to like laterally move within the system, for example. Um, so I thought you did that really, really well. And um, of course, like, as you mentioned, like there are always like other like edge cases, like multi-factor authentication that are difficult to account for. But overall, I really appreciated your very like creative and well thought out responses. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us today, Mo. And Thank you, everybody, for watching. Good luck with your upcoming interviews, all. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to let us know that this video is valuable for you. And of course, check out hundreds more videos just like this at tryexponent.com. Thanks for watching, and good luck on your upcoming interview.